I'd like to talk about the regulation of battlefield technologies, and in particular, the rise in robotics and the challenges that this presents. A hundred years ago, Europe experienced a devastating war, cost billions of lives. War is still with us here today, but the way we fight has been fundamentally transformed by technology. And in these same years, we've also seen an ongoing effort to regulate war, to try and control how we fight and how we use some of these battlefield technologies. When we talk about the regulation of war, we need to understand that actually what we're saying is we accept that war happens. It's not going to go away, at least not in the foreseeable future. And what we're trying to do is to balance, on the one hand, military necessity, and on the other hand, what we call the principle of humanity. So in effect, what we have is an exercise in damage limitation. And new technologies always present a challenge when we're doing that. Part of that is because whenever we develop a technology and we're thinking of it being used on the battlefield, the assumption is usually that this technology is being developed with a military need at heart. And then we need the legal regulation to try and ensure that this principle of humanity isn't left behind. Now, that doesn't always have to be the case. Technologies can also benefit not just the military necessity side, but the humanitarian principles as well. They might minimize some of the destructive nature of war. But it's natural, because of all of this, that whenever we see a new technology being introduced, we're going to find various debates over it and whether it should be used at all or not. And this was true when we introduced the crossbow. It was true with debates over submarine warfare. It was true with gas, with chemicals. And we even had debates when people started talking about using airplanes in war. The transformative power of technology wasn't always clear. Back in 1911, for example, a French general said, aviation, it's a good sport, but for the military, it's useless. Okay. Clearly, he was very wrong. And in most cases, it is obvious from the start what potential technology might have uh, in military terms. And so the law has always been working very, very hard to try and figure out what we do with these technologies when we go fighting. And in some cases, it's led to a prohibition, to a ban. So after seeing the devastating effect of gas on the battlefield, there was a decision. We should never again see gas being used as a method of warfare. In other cases, the technology becomes commonplace. And aerial warfare is a good example. We use it all the time. There are rules on how it's used. Of course, even aerial warfare, <coughs> well, it's not always high tech. Back in World War II, Japanese sent explosive paper balloons over towards the US, some of them reaching as far as the area of Detroit. But really, it's the high-tech versions of aerial warfare that have captured public imagination. I mean, think in recent years, a lot of the debate has been around these things, right? the unmanned aerial vehicles, what we tend to call drones. Now, in reality, when we talk about drones, the legal aspects, if we're thinking about the regulation of war, are not that different to manned aircraft. I mean, the big difference between a drone and regular aircraft is primarily the fact that the pilot isn't sitting inside this thing. The pilot is sitting in a cabin somewhere else, possibly even on another continent. But the legal questions that have come up in recent years whenever we talk about drones are actually the same questions that we would have even if the pilot was sitting inside the airplane. So it's not so much the remote control technology that we're worried about. The bigger challenge comes from automated and autonomous technologies. Automated technologies, we're talking here about the kind of machines that uh, follow a fairly simple, straightforward, pre-designed set of rules, if X, then Y. And they're quite predictable. Okay? And there's lots of them that already are in existence and have been used uh, for, for decades, actually. When we talk about autonomous technologies, we're talking about a machine that can do something like sensing uh, deliberating, thinking, deciding, acting, and doing this for an extended period of time with no human control at all. This becomes a lot less predictable. How far away are we from having this kind of technology, fully autonomous technology? Well, there's a big debate among scientists. Some of them say we're almost there. Some say we'll only be there in decades. There's a debate as to whether it'll ever take the form of something like 
the human brain, what they call full artificial intelligence. Again, unclear. What is clear is that we're moving in that direction. And the more we have these technologies, the more likely we are to see them appear in one form or another on the battlefield. So we already have, right now, for example, the possibility to have uh, robots that are our sentry guards, a robot that stands guard in an area, detects intruders, and opens fire. Okay? That technology already exists. And what we're likely to see with time is an incremental shift from human control of machines to human supervision of machines to a supervision that slowly probably will become looser and looser. And so there are real risks uh, in that regard, and people are quite concerned. And there's work even being done here with at least some people are trying to look towards the creation of robot soldiers robot warriors that will go out and replace soldiers on the battlefield. We don't know what they're going to look like yet. When the media usually shows us robots nowadays, what we see is you know, something like this, a, a cute robot that does everyday household functions. Now, we'd all want one of these, uh, our own little butler, or whatever you want to call it. But when people talk about robot warriors, you know, robot soldiers, then the images that usually you see being conjured up are more like that. You know? big, scary robot with a machine gun. Now, of course, we're the ones that would be building the robots, so it's up to us whether we make them look frightening or not. Could just as easily do this, right? And put a kind, gentle face and have a robot that looks like a human being. And it won't be single robots. You know, if this were to ever happen, there would be whole armies of robots ready to march into battle. They won't just be marching, they'll be flying. There's talk of swarm technology. Swarm technology here, we're referring really to an idea where you could have, for example, a collection of aerial drones uh, that operate together like a flock of birds and with some kind of collective intelligence coordinating their attacks with a common purpose. So it's very clear that these technologies really can fundamentally alter the way future wars might look. And so you've got a debate happening right now in legal circles over what do we do with these technologies. And it's really interesting because usually, and if you look in the past, you'll see that more often than not, the legal debate over regulation of technologies and warfare occurs after the technology has been used. I mentioned gas earlier, for example. First, we saw the horrible effect that gas had on the battlefield. And then we had a decision, hold on, we don't want to be using this anymore. But here, we have a discussion that's happening before we even know what shape the technology is going to take. And that just shows the level of concern that we have with these technologies. And that concern relates to a number of different problems at different levels. So we have concern in terms of the legal side of things, the laws of war. Two of the most fundamental principles in the laws of war are the principle of distinction and the principle of proportionality. The principle of distinction tells us that it's OK to target things and people military, but you must never intentionally target things or people civilian. It's fairly simple, straightforward, understandable to everyone. Uh, it's actually at the heart of most of the laws of war. And then there's a question. If we unleash machines, autonomous machines, on the battlefield, will they be able to abide by this principle of distinction? So for example, would a robot soldier be able to tell the difference between a short soldier with a real gun and a child with a toy gun? Many scientists today would say that machines still wouldn't be able to do that. They wouldn't be able to abide by the principle of distinction in complex scenarios. But some of the scientists would also say, we could get there. Right? So there's, 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 a, there's a real question over this type of situation. The other principle I mentioned is the principle of proportionality. This is the rule that sometimes we refer to as uh, collateral damage. Right? So it tells us that if you're targeting a military target, something that you're allowed to target, but you know that when you target it, there may be civilians nearby, and they might be affected, they might be killed, you need to then weigh the advantage you're gaining from the attack on the military target against the harm to civilians. Right? And you 
balance them against each other, and then you know, is this attack proportionate or disproportionate? And that's the principle of proportionality. Would a robot be able to abide by this? Well, it would need to weigh both sides, and it would need to be able to calculate them each individually before it does that balance. And you can imagine a robot being able to calculate the harm to civilians by something fairly simple, for example, seeing how many civilians are in an area, uh, seeing which weapon is being used, calculating things like the blast radius, uh, the accuracy of the weapon, the failure rate of the weapon, and coming up with some kind of estimate of what would happen to civilians in the area if we carried out this attack. But it would have more trouble with the abstract notion of military advantage. And even if it could calculate them both, balancing one against the other is an inherently subjective judgment that as human beings we have trouble with. So could we leave such a subjective judgment to a machine? So we have problems with some of the fundamental laws of war. We also have some big ethical questions. Does the use of robots on the battlefield mean that we're going to dehumanize and desensitize war to the extent that it makes killing far too easy? Should we ever delegate to machines the authority to kill human beings? So these are big questions. And after looking at all the risks and hearing some of these questions, some of you might be wondering, why on earth would we ever contemplate unleashing autonomous systems onto the battlefield? Well, there's also talk of them possibly having some advantages in certain situations. For example, the principle of distinction and identifying targets. There might be situations where, say, there's a certain building that the military is trying to figure out what that building is, right? and a machine would be able to plug into various networks, connect to a wide array of information, and conduct a comprehensive analysis and do it much faster than any human being could, and reach the correct decision about what that building is, and give us better and more accurate identification than a human might do. Okay? So it could be that in some situations, machines could actually be helpful in this sense, whereas in other situations, they might be dangerous. But there may be advantages and disadvantages to identification. Likewise, the ethical questions. There are big debates here as well, but the illegal and the ethical sometimes are intertwined. So we know that human beings don't abide by the laws of war always, on a, not on a regular basis. And we know, and go back to the Nuremberg tribunals, and we know that some human beings can be as scary as any killer robot, and sometimes far more. Human beings commit war crimes. Look at almost any war around us today. And often these crimes are committed because of emotions such as fear, anger, hatred, stress. <coughs> well, robots, they wouldn't be affected by these emotions. Uh, they wouldn't have compassion either. But some argue maybe that's a good trade-off. You know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't act out of anger or, or fear unless they were programmed to do so. They could take more time before firing because they're not afraid of a risk to themselves. So that could give us more accurate identification. Another aspect here is that more machines on the battlefield means more video footage from the battlefield. More video footage allows for better uh, decision-making and potentially more accountability because all wrongful acts get recorded. And more information from the battlefield also helps the humanitarian side. It allows us to, for example, do better crisis mapping, to know where are the areas that you need emergency supplies, health provisions, food, coordinate relief efforts. And this isn't just through satellite imagery. And there's talk of limited use of drones, for example, by UN peacekeeping forces. So robots could come in handy in all sorts of ways. There's discussion of uh, creating a humanoid form robot to do firefighting in confined spaces, for example, on Navy vessels. Uh, we might have drones and robots delivering aid. Well, all of this could be happening. If you think back to the inspiration for the Red Cross, well, that came from the 19th century Battle of Solferino and the concern for thousands that were left dying and wounded after the battle. Well, perhaps robots might play an important part in alleviating some of that suffering. They could be out there performing emergency medical procedures and evacuating people with ambulance drones taking them to safety. 
So whilst there are huge risks, there might be advantages in other areas to using robots during wartime. And we know that one, in one form or another, this is coming. We don't know what shape it's going to take. We know that we've got these huge legal, ethical, technological questions surrounding it. In the legal arena right now, the big debate is whether we should perhaps be banning some of these technologies up front, or at least saying right at the start, we're never going to use them in certain situations. Or do we try and work on their development to ensure that the way they're used is always in accordance with the laws of war? And so you've got this debate with very strong opinions on both sides. I think it's important to note that a lot of the questions that come up in that debate, particularly the, uh, the legal and ethical basic notions on issues such as allowing robots to control human life, well, they come up in other areas as well. Think about robots performing surgery, robots driving public transportation. So all of this, really, what it's doing, it's raising questions about our future interaction, the interaction of humans with machines. What shape is that going to take? And will sh some of these machines be providing health care and others holding a gun? Personally, I think it's too early to assume we have the answers to all of these questions. The science fiction writer Isaac Asimov once said, the saddest aspect of life right now is that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. And so I think we've got a lot of work to do catching up on our wisdom in these areas. But while we're doing that, we need to remember that technology itself isn't good or evil. Technology is just part of the human endeavor. And the way we use technology on the battlefield <coughs> is simply going to reflect human nature. So what we need to do is to appeal to the better side of our nature in order to ensure that any new technology introduced into warfare is done with a view to minimizing harm and casualties and destruction and in order to reduce the suffering of war. Thank you. <laughs>